Hey everyone, so the topic for today is the archaeological roots of Homo sapiens, the world before farming, 2.5 million years ago to 20,000 years ago, which I'm sure sounds incredibly exciting to all you non-anthropology majors. Um, but no, seriously, I think this topic is actually really cool, and I hope I can show you why it's cool. Um, whereas last week's module was more about sort of how things biologically changed during that time period in the human family shrub, uh, this lecture in this chapter that we read is more about how things changed culturally because what we start to see at this point is that as much as things are physically changing in the fossil record things are really rapidly changing in terms of um, culture in terms of how people make a living how beings live and that becomes sort of um, starts real slow really really slow takes millions of years kind of thing and then it just takes off over the last few thousand years and that's where humans now the vast majority of change that's happening in humans now is not so much our bodies changing but our culture is changing all right well let's talk about the view from physical anthropology and archaeology so last week we talked about the idea that the different cultures have many different ways of explaining human origins and i also talked about the fact that i'm not going to require you to believe in or accept the anthropological sort of narrative of human origins however it is my responsibility that you understand some of that um, narrative so here goes um as far as physical anthropologists are concerned human history the history of hominins, so the history of basically all the things that split from chimps and bonobos and became Australopithecines uh, and Homo habilis and Homo erectus and Neanderthal and Homo sapiens, the history of hominins really goes back, you know, at least 2.5 million years um, to write about where you see Aldewan tools up here. And until 200,000 years, or, and then what we're going to be talking about today starts at 2.5 million years ago and goes all the way to 20,000 years ago. So although that might seem like ancient history to you and not interesting at all, um, from an anthropological perspective, that would be 99% of the history of hominins. 99% of the history of this branch of apes that we call hominins occurred in this time period we're talking about today. So the world in the last 20,000 years, um, the world since farming, so to speak, is with the world that we're familiar with and that we're used to. But I want you to conceptualize in your brain the idea that there were hominins for a far longer period of time if we accept the anthropological narrative. So uh, a lot of things happened during that time, like a lot of things, seriously a lot of things. And so whatever your views on human evolution, whatever your thoughts on human evolution, um, there were these hominin beings that we have fossil record of, and the things that are happening during this time period are really, really interesting. So let's talk about them. All right, I want you to imagine a world for a minute. I want you to imagine a world without art. you still got a human body, but a world without art, a world without language, a world without music, a world without politics, a world without cooking, Dang, how am I going to get my quesadillas now? A world without tools. What would that be like? What would it be like to not be able to have true human language, true human music, true human cooking? What would that be like? It's sort of what the world as faced by the earliest hominins, right? All of those things developed within the last couple of million years, as far as we can tell from the fossil records. So importantly, these things did not always exist. Yes, yes, we can argue that non-human animals engage in certain types of language, but they don't exist in language, or they don't do language the way humans do in the sense of our infinitely varietous languages. Um, yes, we could argue that, you know, birds have a form of music, whales certainly have a form of music that can even vary by pod, but music as humans create it is utterly unique. All these things that make us so unique are things that are recent. They are new, at least from a time frame of sort of geologic time. And so today we're going to talk about when we see some of those things first start to pop up in the fossil record. And to do that, we're going to rely a lot on archaeology. And I want to talk right now um, about the strengths and limitations of what archaeology can and cannot tell us. So archaeology um, is incredible in terms of its ability to uncover lost important past. There's huge swaths of human history where either it was before 
writing or writing was not present in those societies and therefore there's huge parts of the human past not to mention the hominin past right what was going on with things like homo erectus that we just wouldn't know about if not for archaeology um, as one of our main forms there's other forms that we know about too such as oral history but archaeology is one of the main reasons we're able to access huge parts of the history of this world and so archaeology is kind of like in this picture, right? Sort of like opening up a treasure chest and finding lost, amazing information, sort of peeling back the curtain of the past. Um, it's almost like, you know, finding like this hidden history that you had no idea about. Uh, sort of like this guy right here, right? The, I'm not saying it was aliens, but it was aliens guy from the History Channel. Just kidding. It's nothing like that. No, 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 no. That's why I've crossed out his picture with a red marker. Um, that is not what archaeology is. Archaeology is not wild speculation. Um, archaeology is using data and then trying to arrive at conclusions about what was going on. But it really is like opening up a treasure chest and finding this amazing information about sort of where current humanity came from. It's fascinating stuff. Um, it's fascinating when, for example, we found the Lascaux Caves um, in southern Europe. These, you know, some of the earliest examples of really, really obvious paintings by um, human beings that were like really detailed and might have like shamanic sides to them of why people were painting all these animals. Really cool, fascinating stuff. So as we start to look at the fossil record and archaeological record, then going back. Um, we see some really cool things, such as we start to see um, what is called the Oldowan tradition. So in archaeology, when we say like a tradition, quote unquote, what we mean is that we identify a bunch of artifacts that look similar to each other. And we're like, oh, that's when such and such culture, you know, then we give it a name, in this case, Oldowan. And that means like there was a certain type of culture, certain shared way of doing things that was around during that time period. And um, archaeologists are of the opinion and of the theory um, that this time period would have been 2.5 to 1.2 million years ago. So that MYA uh, thing there, just so you can sound quote parties, MYA means millions of years ago. So from 2.5 to 1.2 million years ago, um, you would have had these Oldowan tools, and these would have been being used by Homo habilis and other early hominins. And so Oldowan tools are these like big stone, like kind of roughly hewn, like choppy kind of things. In fact, sometimes we call them choppers, which shows how creative anthropologists are. Um, and they most likely would have been used, as you can see, they're basically like a rock that's like kind of like shaped into parts of it, where it's got kind of a cutty edge, which is the scientific term, of course. And so these cutty edged stone, rough stone tools would most likely have been used by these early, early, early beings like Homo habilis um, to scavenge meat, to cut up meat, right? Which is a huge advantage to having to use your freaking teeth. And this is around the time that humans' teeth start, or rather I should say hominin teeth, start to decrease in size. And one of the reasons that you don't have um, huge fangs in your mouth like a chimpanzee, um, unless you've had some kind of bizarre plastic surgery to give yourselves chimpanzee fangs. So we get these stone tools that allow us to cut up meat which is a huge, huge advantage and helps explain, right, why hominins in general, humans included, don't have a bunch of, you know, Wolverine style claws on our hands. Um, this was revolutionary compared to what other apes were doing, which is why I've got this chimpanzee here, like looking envious and saying, what? Because it's totally different, right? It's not that early ape, or it's not that other apes don't use tools. Uh, the research by people like Jane Goodall shows that they do. Chimps do things like um, peel off parts of a tree branch and then stick it into a termite hive, kind of jerks in that way, uh, and then get termites or ants to eat. So it's not that apes, other apes don't use tools, but the difference between that and taking a stone tool and keeping an image in your mind and crafting or taking a stone rock and keeping an image in your mind of what you want it to be and then working on it for hours until you get one of these, that's a total cognitive leap, right? One of the biggest leaps there is the ability to envision what you want to create the tool into and spend hours working towards that objective. So this was revolutionary. Um, it doesn't seem revolutionary to us, right? When we see a random stone on the ground that's like slightly shaped, it doesn't exactly seem like a rocket ship. Um, but it was for the time period, right? For the time period, this was a huge leap forward. And it was being done um, not by early Homo sapiens, but by things like Homo habilis. And a Homo habilis at that point, hominins, um, I wouldn't even, 
I want to make sure I say this correctly. Your book calls them humans. Um, I sort of object to that at this point. They are Homo habilis and early species um, are sort of fundamentally different from what we think of as sort of modern humans or even um, things like Homo neanderthalus. These were really peoply apes is the best way to call them because their brain capacity at this point, from what we can tell from skulls, was about one third of a modern human's brain capacity, about 500 cubic centimeters. Um, that's barely more than what a modern chimpanzee has. So Homo habilis was making these like really cool stone tools with barely more than what a chimp has, um, neurologically speaking, which tells you a lot of things, including what a crazy difference just a little bit of brain size difference makes and how much hominins were so different than the other types of apes around them. Again, all, just slightly more smart, so to speak, than a chimp, and suddenly we've got stone tools in the record. Pretty crazy. Um, I've got these excited statements of yes down here because I'm saying like this is what archaeology is, not the ancient alien stuff. All right, then you have the Acheulean tool set our tradition from 1.6 million years ago, um, approximately to 200,000 KYA, which again, if you want to sound really cool on social media, throw around KYA, it means thousands of years ago. And during the Achillean period, suddenly there's another quantum leap, although it's not really suddenly, right? So notice these time periods. You basically have the Oldowan tradition for like a million years. So yes, it's like a quantum leap forward from what chimps were up to, but also like basically you have homo habilis and stuff basically just like rocking stone tools for like a million years, right? There's a million years where the biggest invention is like, hey, I have a slightly cooler chopper, right? Um, not a lot of change, but then suddenly we start to see some change here 1.6 million years ago into the Acheulean phase. And you have um, a bunch of really interesting types of stone tools suddenly. Uh, things like bifaces where you have two different sides and I'm doing a hand motion right now and I'm realizing that it's not useful for you at all because you cannot see my hands uh, but they're like a two-sided um, jagged edge to a stone and you have these things that we call hand axes and hand axes is not really the right word for it right as you can look at these things they're really more like triangular stones um, they're not axes in the way that we think of it. It's like having a handle and then a pointed edge. Uh, but they're these things that have these jagged two sides to them. They're kind of triangly. And here's the crazy thing. We're not really sure what Homo erectus, which is what you generally would have had at this point, um, what they were up to with these. There's all sorts of theories. You read about one of them, which we sometimes call the sexy hand axe theory, which how weird are anthropologists that to try to make our stuff more interesting, we use words like sexy hand axe theory. I mean, that's just bizarre, right? But the theory there is basically um, that the ability to craft really, really good hand axes would have been sort of a way of to be really blunt about it, um, dudes showing off, except for these would have been homo erectus dudes, um, showing off to potential mates. And if that sounds silly, um, it's actually not all that silly. So when you look at things like birds and the very colorful plumage that birds often have, um, one of the main theories that biologists have for why birds have male birds have extremely colorful plumage is that it's basically showing off to say to female birds, like, I am so freaking healthy that I can like waste calories making a beautiful coat of feathers. Um, so it's basically like, It'd be like the modern equivalent of somebody like burning money just to be like, look how much money I have. It's kind of like that. Um, or I don't know, doing a thousand pushups, whatever. Um, so sexy hand axe theory is sort of like, look at me, my cranial capacity is really good. I can make a great hand axe. Um, that's one theory. There's also theories that they're really precise because people were like starting to develop artistic inclinations like homo erectus is starting we're starting to see hominins that actually have a desire for aesthetically pleasing things we're trying to explain with these different theories basically like why did suddenly tools start to get a lot more precise and sometimes precise to the point of like wow this is almost like better than it needs to be Whatever they were up to with them, and whether or not there was an aesthetic side or a sexual side, one thing is for certain that these were probably useful for at least some, if not many, different tasks. Uh, some people call them like Swiss Army stones, because you probably could have done a lot of things with them, such as shear meat off of bones. Um, it's possible they were even used for killing meat at this point. Um, there's several archaeologists are of the opinion that these were used as projectiles, which if you think you're cool because you're into that like new craze about axe throwing, which I think is super weird, um, try to imagine back in the day taking like this like hand-sized 
pointed rock and throwing it at an animal. But that's like straight up what they probably did. They've tested these rocks and you're able to do that in most of the time land a hit or a lot of the time. So it's possible they were using them as projectiles at this point. Pretty interesting stuff. Now, here's where I'm going to blow your mind again. Maybe, or maybe at this point you're bored and you've muted the audio already. These, this was not Homo sapiens. This was Homo erectus, which I'm now going to upgrade them from people apes to ap people uh, because they're really still not really like a um, fundamentally homo sapiens right at this point the cranial capacity is two-thirds of a modern human being um, so about double that of a chimp but still far far behind a uh, modern homo sapien um, for probably this is before in a lot of cases this would have been before all sorts of modern um, innovations, and yet they had these advanced tools, pretty cool stuff. And yet at the same time, this lasted like another million years. So I want you to be bored right now, or maybe not bored, but at least I want you to think about how long it's taking for things to change. It's taking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years to make what, in retrospect, seem like really slow changes like oh cool you went from kind of a crappy stone tool to kind of a cool stone tool and it took you a million years so it's happening slowly but as it's happening look what's happening in the fossil record um, the cranial capacities are getting larger and we're starting to see more and more of an ability to develop culture by the time homo sapiens arrive on the scene of course our cranial capacity is huge our brains are super big and super foldy and super malleable and suddenly technology takes off and we have new things being invented all the time to the point where the rate of technological increase now is just preposterous right i remember when internet uh, when i was a kid was a thing you plugged into the wall and sounded like a demon was trying to escape out of a dial-up modem box and also if somebody tried to like call it would interrupt your modem nowadays we have internet connected to our freaking watches right high-speed internet that works all the time connected to our frick well maybe not in alaska but in a lot of places high-speed internet that works all the time connected to your freaking watches so now things can increase far faster than they did at the time because people were working with well people quote unquote um shall i say ap people were working with such a more limited kind of hardware but the hardware was getting better and better the brains were getting better and so things were starting to pick up